following program is brought to you live from the Assembly Chamber in Albany, where Governor Hugh L. Carey will address a joint session of the New York State Senate and Assembly with his second annual legislative message. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor and privilege to present the governor of the state of New York, Hugh L. Carey. Lieutenant Governor Krupsack, Speaker of the Assembly, Steingut, Majority Leader of the Senate, Anderson, Mr. Controller, Mr. Attorney General, members of the judiciary, members of the honorable bodies, ladies and gentlemen of the state of New York, I have the honor to address you as governor of this great state in the long anticipated year marking the birth of our nation before us as a people lie 12 months in which the glories of the past will be recounted. This year, we shall reconsecrate ourselves to those virtues and traditions that made America's mankind's last great hope for freedom and human tolerance. But 200 years ago today, there was no glory, no unanimity of purpose, and no guarantees of success. There was only a small group of men and women who suffered from the clarity of vision that throughout history has driven people to undertake the painful course for the future's requirements. In those days, 200 years ago, Thomas Paine drew the line across the colonial landscape. There were, he said, the summer soldiers and the sunshine patriots who in the crisis shrink from service. But there were also the winter soldiers who recognized that the heart of the conflict the more glorious the triumph. A population had to choose between the crucible and indifference. Now we know that in time the choice was made and made correctly. From the shores of Long Island, from the heights of Manhattan, the Palisades of New Jersey came the leaders <clears throat> and the ranks of the indifferent slowly melted away. But this took time, time and effort, courage and patience, and above all an unrelenting commitment to what must be sacrificed now to gain the promise of the future. It was a long and hard year from the setbacks on Long Island and in Manhattan, with the bloody battle of Oriskany to the turning point of Saratoga. It is well in this year, I believe, to remember our past in these dark terms and leave the historic glories to the governor who shall address you on the 200th anniversary of the revolutionary victory. For although times change, and our daily challenges pale before the significance of that great revolution. The basic human essence remains when we are confronted with things that must be put right. The harsh choices will be faced by those with the courage to see the need. In every generation, the lines are drawn. And again, I believe as indifference fades, the leaders emerge from the crucibles. During the year 1975, this was indeed the case in our state and with our affairs. With the indulgence of your honorable bodies, I would speak beyond you to the people of New York only to remark on your work. A governor can confront a problem of state and fail quite adequately on his own. But no governor can succeed for the people without the support, understanding, and wisdom of the legislature. Time and again, over the past 12 months, I came to this legislature and its leadership with issues and challenges unparalleled in the history of our state. Time and again, the men and women of New York State Senate and Assembly respond with prudence, foresight, and imagination on every matter of vital importance to the well-being and future of New York. The leadership of the Senate and the Speaker of the Assembly 
put aside partisan differences in making the difficult decisions that were the key to our financial survival. And in the true test of leadership, they successfully imparted to their members their understandings of the needs and their commitments to the future stability of our government. To whatever extent history will judge, the work of this past year as most significant in the face of unprecedented crisis, to whatever extent it marks the turning point in the economic health and vitality of New York, the success is yours on both sides of the aisle. The people of New York State can rest assured that whatever faces us in the months ahead is surmountable through the willingness of the legislature to act for the public good without regard to personal inconvenience or political advantage. I salute you, my colleagues, on that achievement. What faces us now and in the months ahead is the great second effort. Over the course of the preceding year, you have provided the support to save the nation's largest housing construction agency. You provided the means and the support necessary to save the leading city in the world, New York City, and the fourth largest city of our state, Yonkers, from degradation and ultimate demise. And we did this together. In meeting the problems of the city of New York, we overcame the misinformation cast before the national public and the resistance of a national administration, which at first responded only with ridicule and a prescription for bankruptcy. Together on a bipartisan basis, and with the assistance of each member of our congressional delegation, we changed that, not only for our benefit, but for the benefit of our country. Over the course of the preceding year, when confronted with the bills due of the days past, you began the process of meeting our obligations by raising the revenues of the state. These were not acts that were pleasing to us, but they were necessary to accomplish. When things had to be put right, in the final analysis, the majority of the men and women in this chamber today had the courage to make the hard choices. Now the time comes again to face the pressures imposed upon us by the new realities. In meeting these pressures, we should have one resolve. We must never promise to the people that which we cannot do. So now is the time, and here is the place, to address the one great issue. There is no press release so artfully drawn that can convince the investing public to rely upon New York State credit worthiness if our budget is not in balance. There is no speech, no financial sleight of hand so clever or quick to get us to market in the spring for approximately $4 billion, funds relied upon by every citizen and community of this state if our budget is not in balance. The agencies of the state will default. School districts will be driven from the market. Programs creating jobs and providing needed services will be ended or severely diminished if our budget is not in balance. In essence, we will be found wanting and in violation of our public trust if New York State does not adopt a balanced budget for the next fiscal year. There is no politics to this, only pain. No one's advantage is involved except that of the people. Only the myopic will persist in the traditional game of seeking politics or advantage from our condition, while those with the strength of vision will take the hard actions necessary for a healthy, stable state economy. On January 20th, I shall place before you the budget of the state for the next fiscal year. Once again, nothing will be hidden. Assumptions will not be used to mask difficult decisions. I will show you and the people of New York the gap that exists between revenues and expenditures and provide legislative recommendations for its closing. There will be cuts to be made in our spending, cuts in state agencies, and limitations on our ability to assist local communities. The budget I will present later this month will finance little that is new. It will discontinue much that is old. It will, for example, encompass a freeze on the wages of state employees and on the rates we pay to those who provide certain services. I shall attempt to spread the burden evenly without consideration to geographic area or political circumstances. We shall be compassionate, seeing to it that the most vulnerable in society are not further disadvantaged. We shall be fair, seeing to it that we maintain our commitments to those who fought so hard 
to achieve equal opportunities and equal rights. I shall be mindful of those who have already felt the effects of the austerity measures of the year past. Too much of a sacrifice, it is said, can make a stone of the heart. We must not allow that to occur in the government of New York State, but we must make reductions. To the extent that we fail to agree on this, to the extent that we do not close the gap through reductions, the only alternative is to increase our revenues. In more normal times, with a more positive national economy, heavy reliance could be placed upon the overall economic growth and the rate of that growth in America to generate new revenues. It is unfortunate but true today that such reliance would not be prudent at this time. Because of that grim fact, we must act on our own. We know the effect that taxes have upon the economic climate of our state, but we also know the human cost of reducing expenditures. Finally, we know that we have no future if our budget is not truly in balance. So the lines are drawn, not by me or by you, but by the realities of the world in which we live. It is only left for us to decide on which side of the line we will stand, with the ranks of the indifferent or with those who will not be driven away by the difficulties of the moment. Should we succeed, and I believe we will, we shall have every right to demand access to credit. We shall have every right to go forward with programs meeting legitimate human needs. But we shall never have the right to again propose programs and appropriate money knowingly beyond our means. As was said in this place at this time, a long year ago, those days are over in New York State. So today, as we begin 1976, with the same momentum and spirit which carried us through 1975, we must finish all we hope to accomplish last year. And in the midst of our retrenchment, in the severity of our economic scarcity, we must continue new and imaginative reforms in the programs, institutions, and agencies of our state. I will be outlining these specifics of my proposals in a series of special messages, which I will begin to present to your honorable bodies shortly. Today, I would like to share with you the themes and directions of the legislation I will propose and the actions I will take. With our state's finances in order, we must assign the same energy, vision, and determination we shared in solving our governmental crises to the state's economy to protect jobs, to create jobs, and to provide greater job security to the working men and women of New York State. In our society, it is still true that in the era of unemployment, the heavy and early burden falls disproportionately upon those who suffer from historic discrimination based on race or sex. We must be ever mindful of this fact. We know the economic heart of our state is troubled. Our unemployment and our inflation both exceed the national rate. We are losing too many people and too much industry to other parts of our nation. Our level of taxes and our debt remind us of the counterproductive actions of a previous government in more prosperous days, days of national growth, which blinded some to the guidelines of prudence. Our present business climate is a source of genuine concern to those who provide jobs, tax revenues, and income for our citizens. My plea and promise to the business community is Give us the time to finish the task of putting our public and private economies in order, and you will see a new era of harmony between social goals and economic goals in the Empire State. For the sake of every New Yorker whose livelihood depends on a healthy economy, I will serve as a personal representative to the business and industries of New York and elsewhere. I will urge business to stay in New York, to come to New York, to develop and grow in New York State, the great strength of our economy, which gives us so much hope for a better future, rests in the labor force of our state, a labor force that is productive, a labor force that is skilled, a labor force which has always demonstrated its willingness to work together with government and industry. To offer more security to New York workers, we must strike a balance between the necessity of regulations on business designed to protect our citizens, and the need to provide incentives for industrial growth and the creation of jobs. We must regulate 
no more than necessary and stimulate as much as we can. There is no inherent conflict in our efforts to protect our environment, our consumers, and the legitimate interests of our business and industry. When we undertake land use planning efforts to improve and protect our environment, for example, we also help the recreational industries which support the economy of the state and its regions. As part of the revenue program passed last year, we began to provide greater tax incentives for industrial and business development, which create more jobs by enacting an additional 3% investment tax credit. We can do more. I have instructed the Economic Development Board to prepare economic impact statements on every proposal to change our present tax structure. And I maintain my support for the elimination of the New York City municipal bond tax. But when we speak of business in New York, we must not exclude agriculture. For many years, agriculture was the most neglected single sector of our economy. Yet, from farm to table, it is New York's largest single industry. In the last session, we passed the Milk Producer Security Bill, which removed the specter of bankruptcy from our farmers in case a milk dealer went bankrupt. This year, we must do more to encourage this vital industry to serve the interests of farmers and the upstate communities and to meet the needs of consumers. Therefore, I will propose legislation to bolster our wine industry, to guarantee the quality of our milk, and to foster economic development in rural areas. In general, it is well to remember that economic projections are not destiny, and economic difficulties should be a spur to our actions rather than a break on our enthusiasm. We can and we will do everything within the boundaries of our power to improve this state's economy. But as a state, we are severely limited by what we can do wisely to strengthen our economy. The cause of much of our economic inertia is in Washington. It is a curse we share with all the residents of our nation, but it is curable. We are the leading state in an industrial belt which contains nearly one-third of the nation's population, yet receives only one-third, one-half the nation's population, yet receives only one-third of the federal funds designed to generate economic growth. I shall seek to form a common purpose for the governors of the kindred states of our region to better coordinate our efforts in Washington to restore economic vitality to the birthplace of industrial America. I am sure that all governors will agree that we can no longer afford to pump our revenues into other parts of our nation without a fair return. We must do more during this historic session than end the financial crisis in the public and private sectors of our state. We must put an end to government by crisis in all areas. Let me address you today on the problems I see in the areas of the state's social institutions, the health of all New York citizens, and what state government can do to protect human freedom and private lives. For too long, government has been dealing with difficult problems by creating more government, by putting too much money in new programs, new agencies, and new bureaucratic structures before it had an adequate understanding of the problems at hand. Massive spending on prison systems, which do not rehabilitate, schools, which do not educate, care for the elderly, which became a moral and criminal scandal medical care programs which invite abuse and do not heal, mental health programs which offer little help for improved mental stability, massive spending on programs which do not work as they were intended to work, no matter how noble their intentions are for the public, neither social nor economic justice. We can no longer afford, in terms of cost and conscience, to institutionalize people who can be better treated at community level. We must work with both the voluntary sector and with private individuals to enhance opportunities for community care. For those who must remain in institutions, we will seek the most humane and effective care possible in treating the elderly who need help, in treating troubled nonviolent juveniles, in treating the mentally ill and retarded, in treating those with alcohol and drug dependency problems. Every program will be directed toward placing those in need in carefully planned and constructed community-based programs wherever possible. The standards for institutional care, which were set forth in the Willowbrook Consent Decree, and which are being implemented pursuant to that decree, will set the standard for the type of institutional care 
we will strive to achieve throughout the state. But as I mentioned today, I must address the concern we share for the health of all the citizens of New York. In his annual address of 1923, Governor Al Smith stood before this honorable body and said in Al Smith's words, too many people are prone to the idea that health is a concern of the individual. I believe it to be the business of the state because the state itself cannot be healthier than its people. So said Al Smith. And because I share Governor Smith's belief, last year our state led the nation in improving its health care system. With the able assistance of Dr. Kevin Cahill, the Special Assistant for Health Affairs, working with individuals in and out of government, we have assembled the most qualified health care management team in the nation. From their work, I am now in a position to outline the most comprehensive package of health care legislation in the history of this state. The specific contents of the proposals will be detailed later this month, when I plan to give the first of an annual series of state of the health messages. The legislation I will propose will address the major health problems of our day. It is designed to reduce medical costs, improve health insurance benefits, provide greater public service by our state's medical schools, and place a greater emphasis on preventive medicine. The Distinguished Malpractice Panel has just completed its recommendation, and we shall move swiftly on its implementation, again on a bipartisan basis. Finally today, I wish to speak to you about government's responsibility to safeguard human freedom and individual privacy. This year, as we celebrate the 200th birthday of our nation, there will be much discourse on the principles of individual liberty, which form the soul of our revolutionary struggle and the heart of our government. Yet, a revolution lives not alone through legends and songs of the past, but in our current actions. What better time than now to renew our pledge whenever the opportunity arises to the protection of all citizens and their rights? What better time to assert that innuendo and fearful implication have no place in our land? We lost sight of certain principles of individual liberty in the 1950s. We must not fall back again despite the furor, and there is no better time than now. Government must renew its obligation in the last quarter of this 20th century to make certain our advancements in truth-gathering technology never become a tool for tyranny against our individual right to privacy, to protect our communities from the violence and fear of crime, to protect our voters from elections in which money can destroy public confidence, and to protect every citizen from corruption in any public office. To begin to meet these ends, I will first propose legislation in this important election year which will place strict limitations on campaign contributions and spending and which will offer a $10 tax credit for political contributions by individuals. The cost of these necessary campaign reforms should be offset by the savings from another necessary reform, the holding of a single primary election in the month of May in the state of New York. That matter... That matter has passed one body of this legislature, and today I continue to urge its passage in the other. Secondly, last year, I signed an executive order which for the first time in New York history mandates full financial disclosure for every policy-making state official. This year, I will propose legislation mandating full financial disclosure for every elected state official. In addition, I will also propose legislation prohibiting legislators and legislative employees from representing clients before state agencies and legislation calling for public disclosure of hospital trustees to eliminate possible conflicts of interest. Thirdly, I will also ask you, through legislation, to ensure the confidentiality of the health records and the credit records of our citizens. But I believe more is required than long overdue reform. Other steps must be taken to protect our citizenry. In order to better protect the public from the violence and fear of crime, we will begin to overhaul our system of criminal justice. I have just received the recommendations of the panel I appointed to study the problems of violent juveniles. As a result, I will propose legislation 
calling for a mandatory one-year sentence in a secure youth facility for any juvenile found guilty of enumerated violent crime and judged dangerous to society by a family court judge. We will maintain this state strict mandatory sentences for dangerous persons convicted of violent crimes, but we will propose to allow the courts greater flexibility in sentencing those not guilty of violent crimes. I will also propose legislation calling for the decriminalization of marijuana to free up our criminal justice system so that it may concentrate on crimes more harmful to our society. My administration is committed to make every effort to root out and prosecute those guilty of corruption in every phase of government, from our system of criminal justice to our state authorities and agencies who made illegal profits in nursing homes or Medicaid mills. Finally, I am going to ask for the cooperation of every decent man and woman in this chamber to end the age of the gun in New York State. To accomplish this, <laughs> to accomplish this, I will propose legislation to severely limit the, quote, legal use, unquote, of handguns through strict standards of ownership and possession and to strengthen our controls over the use of all guns. And I ask you and every elected official in this state to join me in insisting that our laws against illegal handguns be strictly enforced. Last month, I attended the funeral of a young state trooper, William V. McDonough, who lost his life to a person who should never have had his hands on a gun. As governor of this state, it was my first such tragedy and I want no more of it. There is a sign which stands on the Massachusetts border, 20 minutes from here, which starkly proclaims, Massachusetts gun law, violation, mandatory one year jail sentence. I want New York to have its own signs on its own borders. Let me conclude by returning to the one matter that must be put right, if all things are to be put right. I would like the people of New York State and their elected representatives here in this chamber to realize not only the danger of our economic crisis and the pain which comes with one year of economic severity, but to participate in the opportunity and the hope we have for the future. We have learned that government and the people it serves cannot afford to solve all the problems of society. So we enter a new age in which our goals are less government, less spending, fewer government employees, less interference in the lives of our citizens and businessmen, and a new spirit of cooperation by all individuals in government. I recognize that it is difficult for men and women drawn to public service in the hope of improving their communities or the lives of their constituents to face the restraints brought about by our conditions. Our only hope to meet the future challenge of public service lies in removing the imbalance in our accounts and restoring the integrity of our fiscal condition. To do less while more comfortable in the short term will prove to be only an expedient act and everyone in New York, including each of us, will pay the price. So once again, the call is out, as it was in the snows of two centuries ago, to run the risks that foresight demands. Once again, the historic test of leadership is presented to us, and we must meet it during this session without pause. And if history is more a guide than a game in this bicentennial year, I can assure you that once again, leaders will be born in the struggle and the indifferent will be left to their empty rewards. But in all of this, I assure you, we will continue to meet our obligations to the elderly and to the infants, to the hungry, the poor, and the sick, and to all those who depend on our compassion for their well-being. That commitment is the measure of American history and a continual source of pride for all New Yorkers. The question then is whether the elected officials of New York State will prove again they are bred to harder things than short-run triumphs whether we can turn away from the illusion of immediate advantage to the greater goal, because it has been written, of all things known, that is the most difficult. Last year, 
We acted together on many things that were difficult. We must continue this year in the same spirit of cooperation and understanding. The people we represent, I believe, demand it, and they shall be served. And we shall not be found wanting, but rather working together in 1976, the great year of the bicentennial in the great state of New York. Thank you and God bless you. On behalf of Senators Anderson and Orenstein and the members of the Senate, I wish to thank Speaker Steingut and the members of the Assembly for their hospitality this afternoon. This joint session of the legislature is adjourned. <laughs>